more than 6,000 meters high lies the most mysterious, legendary country, the roof of the world, Tibet. When Tibetan Buddhism started in the 8th century, it changed the consciousness of the ancient tribes of the Himalaya. Spiritual knowledge and experience, the arts and science were kept in 10,000 monasteries, the centers of Tibetan culture and of mystic experience. Shangri-La, land of happiness, the people of Himalaya called this land, where everyday life and spiritual wisdom grew into one. The Dalai Lama, here as a child, was the spiritual and political head of this land, the largest independent state in the Himalaya till 1950, when the Chinese Red Army occupied Tibet and claimed it as a part of China. At this time, the Dalai Lama was 15 years old. 1959, worse news shook the world. The Tibetans were no longer willing to watch the destruction of their culture in their own country. From remote, mysterious Tibet, reports as shrouded in mystery as the country itself. News of an uprising against Chinese communist rule. The young Dalai Lama, revered by his people as a living Buddha, was reported under arrest by the Reds, but according to other sources is safely in hiding. Some accounts say the anti-communist revolt has even spread into two Chinese provinces. One clear fact, Red tyranny is not wanted by these intensely religious people. The 23-year-old God King of Tibet makes his first public appearance since his escape from the Chinese communists. No one could have told from his unruffled bearing as he was greeted by high Indian officials and presented with the white scarf, token of friendship, that the Dalai Lama had been in mortal danger since he left Lhasa. The 23-year-old spiritual head of the 500 million Buddhists throughout the Far East confirmed that he had been forced to leave his capital. His mother, center, sister, and other relatives had accompanied him from Lhasa. The Buddhist world prays for the day when the Dalai Lama will be restored to his earthly capital. In a dramatic escape, the Dalai Lama was forced to go into exile. Here, in northern India, he found a new temporary home. In this year, 80,000 Tibetans followed him. More than 200,000 people were killed in Tibet. Since then, Tibetan culture has spread all over the world. And here, in India, Tibetan art, culture and lifestyle are more alive than ever. Here are newly built Tibetan monasteries, like this one, Yangchugling. Here are Tibetan villages where people continue in their traditions, some of them supported by international human welfare organizations. Today is a special day. Clouds of incense, flowers and flags are everywhere. The village is waiting for the arrival of the Dalai Lama. He is here for some days to lead the inauguration of the new main monastery, Yang Chubling. Everybody wants to be here now. White scarves are worn as a sign of welcome. The people wear their best dresses. The Dalai Lama is more than their highest political and spiritual leader. He is the symbol of their return to a free Tibet. Everybody in the village is welcoming the Dalai Lama. The school children are singing. The Tibetan flag is waving in the sky. A small carpet factory built up by the women of the village is one of the main attractions of the visit. The Dalai Lama is showing his interest and appreciation for the new factory and talking with one of the Tibetan women. She is missing Tibet, she says. She would like to go back. Why don't you ask the Dalai Lama? It is possible today. But they all know that this is not as easy as it sounds. Under the traditional umbrella, the Dalai Lama continues to visit the points of interest in the village, the hospital, the school and the temple. The children of the little school are singing for him the song of Tibet. 
a new generation of Tibetans is waiting for the day of their return to Tibet. Their dream is a new democratic Tibet, a free and open-minded spiritual country in the Himalaya, the Dalai Lama's vision of a zone of peace. Goodbye and see you in Tibet, the children are singing. The Dalai Lama leaves the temple. Next to him, the head of the new monastery nearby, an important High Lama of the new Tibet, Trikun Kyabgyurn Chetsang Rinpoche. <laughs> After, the prayer wheels turn, and the Dalai Lama lightens the atmosphere with laughter. The Tibetans love him deeply, as he is their most important bridge to the rest of the world. But no matter how peaceful it may be here in the Tibetan colony, in Tibet itself, the situation has not really improved. The overall situation is such as it tense, tense, tense. So you see the people negative to their reaction towards Chinese, also you see the increasing. So the Chinese, Chinese is like you see, stepping up more aggressive, also more, more aggressive to the nation. So there is real danger to reach a point where open clash may happen. So this is really, I, I worry. So you see, if I, if I can go there, I can cool down the situation. How strongly the Tibetan people support their exiled leader is shown in these amateur pictures from 1989. When the Dalai Lama received the Nobel Peace Prize, the people in Lhasa started to celebrate spontaneously in the streets. White pieces of paper Symbols of luck are everywhere. Everybody came together in the streets of Lhasa. If there is any symbol of the return to a free Tibet, it is the Dalai Lama. But the Chinese military is always present and ready to use force any time. If I you see, go to Tibet at that time, Many Tibetans may come on street. So, in the name of law and order, the Chinese might take a certain a drastic action. For their lack of the knowledge, the complete ignorance about Tibet, about Tibetan culture. So, so hold their, as they, as I think, their practice is based on, on that ignorance. And on top of that, the communist is the way of thinking. They always is the forcing or imposing their will, their view on other people. And thirdly, they simply is believe the power of God. Lhasa, 1987. Scenes from a civil war. Since 1950, human rights are brutally suppressed in Tibet just because a peaceful nation wants to live how they always used to live. In 1993, the situation has not changed. In spite of Chinese brutality, in spite of Chinese unjustice sort of attitude, still we're pursuing non-violence uh, through compassion. <laughs> The Dalai Lama's policy seeks understanding and harmony between opposites. The future of Tibet is his dream of a zone of peace in the heart of the Himalaya. An ecologically conscious, democratic and modern country that still draws its energy from deeper spiritual sources. An exceptional state, like a bridge for all human beings from Western materialism to a deeper spiritual experience of life. Here, in a Tibetan village in northern India, we begin to understand. O Mani Padme Hum, the Dalai Lama is speaking the sacred words. A moment of communion with his people that is renewing the bond between them. The strong inner faith that allows the Tibetan to master the most difficult situations in life derives from their deeply rooted belief that nothing in the world happens without a reason. Everything everybody must go through is nothing but the result of his karma, 
the result of his own earlier actions. What this means explains Drikun Kyabgun Jetsam Rinpoche, the head of the 800-year-old Drikun Kadja order of Tibetan Buddhism. Earlier we have a... Of course, this is a very long time, it's 800, 700 years, this is uh, almost 3,000 monasteries. Now this is all changed, you know, all changed Tibetan story, especially Cultural Revolution, all destroyed. No, no left one. Destroy the old, create the new, was the slogan of Mao Tse Tung's Cultural Revolution. 10,000 monasteries, centers of the Tibetan culture, were destroyed or burnt. The precious pieces of art were stolen, sold or melted down. The monks were tortured, banned or thrown into prison. This amateur movie of 1989 was filmed with a hidden camera. They sent me to farm. So I was working there, um, very hard work, and uh, maybe about uh, 15 hours a day. So every cook. after this work, I have to come back. I have to carry my water and I cook everything myself again, work the housework, you know. Yeah. However, it is a good experience, you know. It is a uh, lend me hard life, you know. Tibet, 1990. A tourist video showing a secret ceremony. Spiritual practice is still forbidden in Tibet, but the lamas don't give in to political pressure and the sound of the sultras have always been a mightier force for Tibetans than the fire of the guns. Yes, sometimes uh, we have uh, heard this thing, we have uh, pain our mind, you know. But I am not uh, angry that person. I am not angry in Chinese, any, any person. Also, this is connection with the karma, you know. He doesn't have a choice, because his first, uh, first life, he also done the very negative karma. So this, this life also is very hard, you know. Karma, the cosmic law of cause and effect. Whatever you do, you do it to the whole. And because you are part of the whole, it returns to you. Whatever happens to you is the result of what you have done in the past. What you do now will become your destiny tomorrow, the evolution of the human soul. Whatever you dislike happened, is also cost of the, your previous life. In other words, and this, uh, whatever, what kind of action you done, whatever kind of action you done, then that is the decision of your future. Every evening the villagers surround the temple and turn the prayer wheels as in ancient Tibet. Not far away lives the yogi, a famous Tibetan hermit and master of meditation. The people of the village are proud of him and seek his advice. His songs are sacred, his presence can heal, say the people. The yogi is the practitioner of the spiritual. He lives from the donations of the people and concentrates most of his day, his whole life long, on meditation. People say that great yogis can choose their moment of death and pass to the other world in meditation. Some of them are said to develop paranormal powers. While the yogi gives his advice, his disciple is continually turning a prayer wheel. It is an honor for him to be so close to his master. The yogi was already famous in Tibet. So many people wanted to see him. He received special permission from his master to see them an exceptional rule for a hermit. The yogi is for the people here a living example of the practice of meditation and spiritual experience. The yogi's teacher was a great Tibetan yogi who surrounded himself for years with walls without windows and doors. No one could see him and for many years his disciple had to pray to receive his master's physical presence till he finally allowed the walls to be destroyed. After being forced out of Tibet, he started a new life here in northern India, near Yangchubling. 
I was already meditating in Tibet before the Chinese came. But then, after the occupation, I was too disturbed in my meditation. I couldn't continue it there, so I had to come here and start again. That was 18 years ago. The yogi is said to have the gift of psychic healing. What is his opinion? The cause of all illness is that you fix yourself onto your ego. Rage, fear, hate, jealousy, all this creates 424 illnesses. First you must lose your dependency on the illusionary world of matter before any healing can start. When I began, I was very sick myself. My feet were swollen, I had permanent headaches, liver, heart and kidneys were in a terrible state. But now, after 14 years of meditation, I am well and healthy, with no health problems at all. On this night, a rare ritual is performed at Yang Chubling Monastery nearby. Two hours after midnight, the monks come together in the temple to prepare themselves in a special meditation for the tantric dances that follow tomorrow. Their red ceremonial hats show that their monastery is part of the older, non-reformed Kaju tradition that is specifically concentrating on mystical sides of man. The transformation of consciousness the preparation for our journey into the beyond. Weeks of fasting and meditation about absolute emptiness are now behind them, and the fact that their new monastery was finished only a few days before makes this ceremony even more special for them. Buddha is for Tibetans not only a specific historical personality, it is the embodiment of enlightenment and the pure, clear consciousness that can appear in different forms of living beings. The two highest three Kunkhaju Lamas, for example, that lead the meditation tonight, are also considered as reincarnations of Buddha. Three Kunkhaju and Chetsan Rinpoche, to the right, is, like the Dalai Lama, the reincarnation of Buddha Chenrezig the Buddha of Compassion, and Vikung Kyabjian Chunsang Rinpoche to the left as reincarnation of Patsambhava, the Indian yogi and founder of Tibetan Buddhism. He is still living in Tibet and is here for the first time. The gods of protection are invited into the meditation. Man thanks the gods and renews the bond between the immortals and himself. After weeks of purification, all the energy will now be directed towards the masks of the gods that are exhibited in the temple. The gods themselves may be present now and fill the masks with their energy. Sounds play a major part in Tibetan meditation. Sounds clear the mind, invite the gods and ban demons. Bells, trumpets and cymbals release positive vibrations. Drums and long horns ban negative spirits. Music is an act of evocation, a magic moment. Sound is a way of directing psychic energies.
During the meditation, tea is served, as always in Tibet. The gods of protection sometimes look terrifying, but they are friendly to man. They are helping him in the world of spirit. Their masks are hanging at the walls of the temple, and in the coming days, when the monks will dance with the heavy mask, they will become mediums of those gods. The masks and the monks become the medium through which the gods communicate with man. Between the long meditation periods, soup is served. For hours, the monks are praying to the gods of protection. May they guide us safely through the beyond, show us the way, protect us from evil spirits, and help the lost souls on the way. The clapping of hands is a symbolic gesture of banning negative forces. High Lamas and monks are falling into a deep meditation, as if the gods they invited are now present all over the room. The skulls and bones in their faces are there to remind man of his mortality. The central mask on the altar shows Mahakala, the highest protector of the universe. To the left of it, the pyramid-shaped object is a symbol of the deity in its abstraction. To the right, Achi Chirdron, the goddess of protection of the Kunkaja order. Achi actually means grandma. Sometimes the Tibetans have a very personal relationship with their deities. The meditation goes on till the morning. What the monks here are seeking is a transformation of consciousness, a quiet distance from the illusionary world of matter where things are not what they seem, and entering into a realm of pure consciousness and compassion, of pure light. The Buddha nature of man. That is what the monks and yogis, the lamas and magicians here in the Himalaya mountains are living for life after life. If you want to meditate, you have to do it for your whole life. Meditation isn't only something spiritual, it's also physical. You have pain, you have no good clothes, no good food, and you have to work on yourself for many hard years. But without it, you can't reach anything. You can't get enlightenment without meditation. You will need three years, three months, and three days to find out what meditation really means. After this come many more steps. It's not easy. After three more years completely in meditation, you will understand relativity. 
Nothing and nobody is separate from the other. Everything is connected with each other. After the next three years, you will understand what emptiness means. You're beginning to leave your ego. Three years later, you will be leaving the imprints of the material world in you. You will begin to leave the world of illusion. Another three years, and you understand the secrets of 3,000 universes. And three years after this, you will understand the wisdom of Buddha himself. The next morning, the song of the yogi opens the day. May my body become the body of Buddha, my spirit the spirit of Buddha, and may I follow in my way the ways of the great masters, and may all beings feel love and compassion. And may the gods of protection and guiding spirits always be on my side. Late morning in Yang Chubling. Today, the tantric dances begin, one of the most famous artistic and religious events in Tibetan culture. After their night meditations, the monks will perform dances in trance, a mystic drama following ancient traditions. Thousands of people have arrived to see them. At the beginning, the magicians with their typical golden hats perform an evocation and purify the scene. The clowns with their long white beards are the fools of the scene. They are allowed to joke about everything and confuse things during the performance. In slow flowing movements, the dancers start moving. Every step, every movement has an exact defined order for hundreds of years. Every expression and move of the body has a specific symbolic meaning and is written down in the ancient texts. Many of the steps and gestures have a name, like floating ocean waves or touching three times the center of the palace. And all of them derive from mystic experiences in meditation. The procession of the dancers moves in a spiral. The clowns throw flour on the ground, marking the way of the dancers. Even the foolishness of the clowns can overcome ignorance. The place has become now a mandala, a centered object of meditation. Whatever happens in this performance has a deep philosophical and symbolic meaning, like the spiral on the ground now that reminds one of the never-ending process of spiritual evolution. The tantric dancers follow ancient magic rituals where God meets man and the mortals are invited to share a glimpse of eternity with their immortal spiritual guides. They are moments of initiation. The dancers are beginning to fall into trance and experience a union with gods and protectors that they express and represent. Between the different parts of the program, the dancers are changing their masks.
Outside, pictures of tangas are traded, paintings showing the mythological world of Tibetan gods and great spiritual teachers. Many of their characters are just appearing now in the dances. After the procession of the musicians, the clowns bring the dorma, the ritual object on the altar we saw last night. On the ground is the hexagram, symbol of the union of male and female. It reminds one of the origin of the dances in the Tantra, the secret teachings of Indian magicians seeking the transcendence of sexuality. Now animal masks are dancing around the dorma. They have strange names. The tiger is called the lasso of compassion. The wolf, bell of the equalness of all beings. They are helpers of the gods. During the performance, negativity and ignorance will be destroyed, represented by the yellow piece on the floor. The sound of the horns activates the forces of light. The origin of the Chan dancers reaches back to pre-Buddhist times, maybe even back to blood sacrifices of the ancient Tibetan Burn religion. Buddhism has integrated the rituals of the religions before it and uses them as peaceful symbols of a spiritual process of learning. Now the deer masks are performing, the most famous of all the masks. The deer are part of Yama's court, the god of death. They are wearing a bowl made from bones. Her dance is a magic evocation, similar to shamanistic rituals. The deer is regarded in shamanism as the bearer of the soul too. The dancers perform difficult physical movements with the heavy masks. If they manage to perform the most extreme gestures, it is regarded as an auspicious sign. Ancient texts characterize the dancers like this. The god of Epos descends and inspires the dancers so that the gods may show themselves through the masks. Yama follows, the god of death. He and his helping spirits are buffalo-headed. The monks are falling more and more into trance during their dancing. The texts describe it in a poetic way. When the dancers move, it looks as if the god Garuda would be flying. They are moving like the hunting tiger, and their hips are swinging as though they had no bones. At the end of their trance state, the texts say, the god of Epos has dissolved like the rainbow. Everything in the tantric dances is exactly described in the traditional texts. Every character, every gesture and meaning have been fixed for centuries. Like the tankas, the most famous works of Tibetan spiritual art. Tankas are paintings and wall carpets showing the gods and saints as the texts describe them a fantastic mythological world created for contemplation and meditation. The painters are monks and spiritually trained. This evening, we are visiting one in the monastery. Painting tankers is a spiritual discipline like meditation and yoga and needs the personal instruction of a master. Tankers are some of the highlights of Tibetan art and one main export article. You're seeing here two kinds of tankas. A bright one showing sacred people and high spiritual teachers, and a dark one showing terrifying looking gods of protection. Painting tankas is a very ancient art form brought to Tibet from India and China thousands of years ago. 
While the painters are working, some monks are spontaneously chanting sutras at the window. Tankers are, like the masks of the gods, symbolic pictures. They may show saints, gods, or simply the emptiness, the center of everything. But they always contain strong spiritual messages. Messages to the subconscious that reveal themselves only in meditation and concentrated observation. Their characters are archetypical elements of men. By looking at them, another world opens, activating our hidden intuitive knowledge, changing the consciousness of the observer, images that talk to the soul. The day of the dancers opens with Mahakala, the highest protector of the universe. Mahakala is wearing a sword as a sign of intellect and a bowl made from a skull as a symbol of happy feeling. The skulls on his face show the mortality of man. All the knives and swords used in the dancers symbolize the destruction of ignorance. the gods of protection come in. Whatever could be stronger than man in nature becomes a respected deity in Tibetan mythology. The Tibetans are embracing their gods and become their friends. The green-faced creatures are the monsters of the great Tibetan lakes. The masks of the gods are, similar to the Tankas, like dream visions. Tibetan gods are archetypical characters of human behavior. Growing up from childhood with these images in mind gets the Tibetans used to the ultimate transformation in man's life, the confrontation with death. Archie Churdron comes next, the goddess of protection for the Drikung Kaju monks. She is wearing a mirror symbolizing clairvoyance and a jewel that means wealth. Her dance is an expression of joy. The tantric dances are practiced today only in some remote parts of Ladakh and Sikkim. Now that Yang Chubling has been opened, they can be passed on and practiced here in northern India too. An important aspect of Tibetan religious art can survive. Between every dance, the musicians proceed in continual procession. They have trained for their performances for months. The monk that played Achi has danced until he's completely exhausted. Helpers must lead him from the scene. It is not easy to keep one's balance wearing the heavy masks. The audience knows every dance of the program and its meaning since childhood. Now, all the main gods are on the scene. The red-faced god San is performing. His moods are quite changeable sometimes. He's followed by the yellow-faced Chinese-looking god of wealth, one of the four gods of heaven. Heroic legends now become a part of the drama too. The flags on top of some of the hats remind one of the historic dress of the Tibetan warriors going back to the time when Tibet was a political superpower more than a thousand years ago. 
Now all the main gods are dancing. They represent archetypical aspects of man, such as love, hate, fear, joy, or compassion. After days of dancing, the dancers end with the sound of horns calling the forces of light. When the tantric dances are over, we see visitors from the mountain regions of the Himalaya in their typical dress. Most of them are coming from Ladakh. Some of them are relaxing in the little street cafe outside the monastery's dairy farm. When the sun sets over Yang Chubling, the villagers surround the temple again and turn the prayer wheels. If the children have fun at the same time, nobody feels disturbed. Laughter and fun are no contradiction to a spiritual life. In the evening, we see the yogi again. Another visitor from Ladakh is in discussion with him. Can the yogi see into other lives, his own or other people's? Sure, I can see into other lives. If I couldn't, I wouldn't be a yogi. It's only your ignorance that stops you seeing it, and your ignorance is the result of your karma. If you cannot see the inner relation of things, you will be unable to understand the outside world. But all this isn't important. Who you were, you will find out soon enough in the intermediate state after death. You don't have to know that. That's only curiosity, nothing else. Forget about it. What's important is how you live, that you don't hurt anybody. That's good enough. To understand the final wisdom of Buddha, that is very difficult. Just follow your heart. That's all you can do. evening in the Tibetan village. People are shopping in the village store. The Dalai Lama's influence has peacefully built a bridge between the traditional life in Tibet and the modern world. The new Tibet keeps its spiritual roots and embraces a new age. On the other side of the road are the tents for the guests from Ladakh, where one third of the population follows the old Drikun Kaju tradition. More than a thousand of them have arrived to celebrate the new monastery. A two-week journey by bus, by car, and by foot. In the remote Himalaya state, people live almost as they did in old Tibet.
the experiences of the Drikun Kadju monks always centered round the one big transformation of the spirit, the guidance of the soul in the moment of death. The Tibetan Book of Death is full of images of the world beyond this world. Many of them are like the pictures on the tankas or the faces of the gods in the dances. For this moment of transformation exists a spiritual technique. It is used to raise the consciousness to an instant moment of enlightenment and may only be practiced by specially qualified lamas. Only once in 12 years is this technique given to the people. Today is this day. The day of Drikung Pawa, the concentration of the white light. The monks here have been practicing it for 800 years. The sign of the order contains it in a symbol, the white light of enlightenment. Today, everybody gathers together in front of the temple where the two highest Drikung Kaju Lamas Chetsang and Chunsang Rinpoche are leading the ceremony. A high lama from Nepal gives the mandala, a symbol of the universe, to Chunsang Rinpoche. Its five elements symbolize the four continents and the mythical mountain Miro, the center of the world. People from Ladakh and Tibet come to the two lamas and receive blessings in the form of green and white scarves. The audience is throwing white scarves towards the throne of the lamas, a sign of joy and thanks. Then meditation follows, concentrating on the mortality of man and the natural end of all matter. Chuntsang Rinpoche, who is still living in Tibet and only here as a special guest, gives thanks for the opportunity to hold this ritual publicly for the first time in 34 years. After this, the traditional texts are read and are part of the Drikung Pawa and remind man of the moment when the spirit will leave the body and pass on to the beyond. Everybody is falling into a deep meditation and concentration on that energy that is called the pure light. This technique is regarded as a direct way to the moment of enlightenment. It is also the main ceremony in Tibet that accompanied people in the moment of death. We give this teaching for what is your consciousness directly sent to the Buddha, I mean, Sava, pure land. So if you get there, so then you, you're more opportunity to, uh, easier to get enlightened. Mm -hmm. so after you practice, you have these uh, uh, blessings, you have to practice this. And some people dying, you also uh, doing this. You also, the Dukumen Monastery, all the people died, the body is bringing there. Then they're doing this power and uh, transferring the uh, consciousness of the, to, to the uh, pure land. Now Chun Sang Rinpoche explains to the public the basics of the Drikung power a transformation of consciousness in which the white light of the spirit leaves the body through the vortex and unites itself with the cosmic consciousness till it reaches what the Tibetans call Buddha's toe. It then returns to the body again. Whenever the Lama says the word hicks, the light leaves the body. When it comes back, it is projected to the people and passed on to everybody.
This is one of the highest moments for the people here. Japanese scientists found that brain and heart frequencies of the meditating lamas in this moment are similar to those of dead bodies. Many yogis in Tibet and India have been famous for the gift of leaving their bodies in the highest moment of meditation and entering the next world. Maybe this young yogi will say goodbye to the world one day in the same way. Now again, people come to the lamas to receive blessings and advice. Many visitors come from far away, like this nun from Taiwan, where the order has many followers. Chetsang Rinpoche, the High Lama of Yang Chubling, believes we have all met before. So we have 12 years, once the 12 years to in this big pit. They come in all over the place, you know. Uh, <coughs> so I think they have certain... Uh, they had uh, attended the, attend the past life there. Some they did a lot of uh, virtues, you know, some good karmas. Uh, so this time they pray because of their prayer powers and the blessings of their, so they could come here, uh, meeting together also. <laughs> Here in Yang Chubling, other things count. Here, people learn something like the culture of the soul, a culture we need everywhere, desperately. But how can a modern person achieve that? What advice would a Lama give to us after all? Love and compassion is best. Make one good, good heart. Then will be, you will be happy. Your family will be happy. You all, all, all the world will be happy. Then happy, you know hatred, no negative then you will be step by step enlightened. So I will pray this also. We are at the end of our journey. Now life will go on as it always was. New monks will be trained here, new reincarnated children will be found and grow up here, and a new generation of wonderful children will make themselves ready for their return to the roof of the world. It may still look far away, but historic changes can happen in a moment now. We only hope that the Dalai Lama will realize his vision that he himself describes. It is my deepest prayer that the misery of Tibet will be changed and that my country, the roof of the world, may be able again to serve as a zone of peace and a source of spiritual inspiration in the heart of Asia. It will happen, since one saying has never lost its truth in the Himalaya. La Kyel Lo. The gods will be victorious. <laughs>